So yeah, my name is Chris Lawler. I'm a, a regional liaison advisor at the General Medical Council. Um, if you saw the keynote this morning, you may have seen a few of the first slides, but I'm going to talk a bit about my role at the GMC, what I do, and then we're going to go on and, and look at the, the GMC guidance around social media, and, and we'll look at a few examples of of bad use of social media or, or where doctors have found themselves being tripped up when, when using social media. We'll talk about a few case studies, so uh, hopefully you'll be able to get involved using the, the chat function and, and talk about some of the case studies. And then depending how we go with time um, towards the end of, of the session, we, we might have a quick look at sort of professionalism in general and, and we'll do a bit of a ranking exercise with some examples that I will give you. But we'll get started and, and my role at the GMC is as part of the re regional liaison service. So I'm part of the outreach team at the GMC. And it, if some of you are, are practicing doctors, if you are based in the Northwest, you, you may have already met me previously. Um, my role is to go out and, and meet with doctors on a regular basis, really. So my team was set up about seven years ago now at the General Medical Council because Quite rightly so, I, I would suggest there was, you know, the view from the profession that the GMC, we were sat in our offices in, in London and Manchester, and we, we didn't get out and we didn't engage with the profession on a regular basis. So, you know, prior to the, the pandemic and, and the UK going into lockdown, three or four days a week, I would be out at medical schools, trusts, GP practices around the Northwest, delivering sessions about the, the work of the GMC to medical students, trainee doctors, doctors of, of all levels, really anybody who has an interest in, in learning more about the GMC guidance and standards and wants to engage with the GMC, I will go out and meet with and, and deliver sessions. So my a big aspect of my role is promoting the work of the GMC, but I think the most important aspect is just meeting face to face with with doctors on a regular basis and giving doctors the opportunity to meet someone from the GMC and to you know give feedback to the GMC, ask questions of the GMC, and hopefully over the the coming months we will be able to return to some form of normality and face to face sessions will be able to res resume, but. So sort of in the meantime, over the last four months, I've been running lots of sessions like this virtually. It's a very different experience, but seem to be working well and, and people are adapting to these sessions. So we've been running lots of sessions to, to try and support doctors as best as we can during the pandemic. So I'm not going to go through this slide in great detail because I, I touched on it in the keynote. And, and if you've been to any GMC sessions before, you've probably seen this slide on, on numerous occasions. But we'll just highlight sort of two aspects, really, that the top of this jigsaw piece around education. So the GMC have responsibility for both undergraduate education in terms of setting the standards that medical students can expect to receive at med school and then also postgraduate education. So setting and monitoring the standards that trainee doctors can expect to receive when they are part of a training program and receiving training and education on a regular basis. So if, if any doctor or student in that environment feels that they aren't receiving the, the opportunities and the experience that they should be, then getting in contact with the GMC might be a good place to start in terms of querying that and trying to move those issues forward and just focus on on the middle piece of the jigsaw so the standards aspect so that is really my my job on a regular basis is to go and talk about the standards that the gmc produce and have in place and to promote you know doctor's awareness and, and understanding of those standards. There, there are 36 pieces of guidance on, on the GMC website, and I would never expect any doctor that I meet with to have read all of those pieces of guidance or even be aware of all of those. But my role is to try and promote that awareness and, and encourage doctors to, to use the, the, the standards as best as possible. 
So today we're, we're going to focus very much on um, this social media guidance. So there's a little picture of that there. And this is one of our supplementary pieces of guidance. So it's a couple of A4 pages long, isn't extremely detailed like some of the other areas of guidance. It very much focused on you know the specific use of social media and how that can impact on a doctor's career. And then looking at you know, patients' use of social media and covering quite a lot of aspects. So we'll look at that guidance. We'll talk a bit about patients' use of mobile devices and also patient behavior online. And we'll kind of get into some conversations around that. So hopefully you can get involved with those. So I guess that the starting point in terms of the GMC guidance around the use of social media is to point out that actually when the GMC, when, when we talk about social media, we are not just thinking about the the standard apps that, that people are likely to have on their, their smartphone. So I think if you ask most people what social media is, they would start with maybe Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, Snapchat maybe, you know, those types of apps that you've got on your phone that you go on regularly, you know, to share information with friends, to maybe share your opinions on things. And I think that is generally what we think of of so of being social media. But in terms of the GMC guidance, it goes into a lot more detail. So it covers things such as blogs or articles. So, you know, lots of medical students or, or doctors want to share their experiences, particularly during the, the pandemic. There's been loads of useful things shared on Twitter and um, lots of useful articles written about, you know, doctors' experiences during the pandemic. And, and that has been extremely positive. But there, there is guidance there to support doctors who want to, to share those experiences. If you are leaving reviews of things, if you are sharing videos, that type of stuff. So it doesn't just cover the, the standard social media apps that, that we would all think about, I, I, I would imagine. So if you if you are interested in those other areas, then, then the guidance is a good place to start. So I'm going to start with a quick sort of straw poll. Anybody who's in the session now in the chat box, just have a, a quick yes or no if you own a smartphone and if you or if you have any of the standard social media apps on your smartphone, just a quick yes or no in the in the chat box to get an idea. Linda's the first one to go, yep. Coming through thick and fast now. Yeah, mo most people, most people in the world now own a smartphone. Um, this survey was carried out a few years ago now, so it's, it's a bit out of date. But um, uh, five hospitals were surveyed a few years back and 98.9% .9 of the staff members involved in that survey you know, owned a smartphone. Not too sure what the other one percent were using to communicate with with the rest of the world. Uh, you know, most people now own smartphones, know how to use smartphones, and that's made it so much more easier for us to to use social media because it's there at, at the touch of a button. You, you log onto your phone, you are there with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can access it. You know, at any point, any time of the day, so easy to use on a regular basis. And then of the the doctors and um, the other medical staff who were who were included in the survey, a third of those a third of, of those staff members said that they used web web based messaging apps to send clinical information. So things such as WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. Um, other types of messaging services, you know, is something that was being used regularly. This was back in 2017. I would imagine, you know, three years on, that would have increased. I, I would think it would be more than a third of clinical staff are, are using web-based messaging. Is that something that, again, those that are in the room, do, do you use sort of those messaging services to communicate with colleagues and, and to seek support on a regular basis in in, in your day-to-day -day work.
Yep, so not as a medical student, but senior doctors often do. Yeah, so I guess for, if, if from a medical student perspective, you, you may be on placements for short periods of time. You, you might not be included in, in those larger WhatsApp groups, as, as Sabina has just touched on then, that you, know, you have a, a large WhatsApp group for your cohort. And that is absolutely the norm nowadays, I think. I meet with foundation doctors on a regular basis and most foundation doctors at any trust that I go to will have an F1 group, an F2 group, maybe a whole foundation group where they will they will support each other, that they'll share experiences and and it, it's really useful to be honest. I think you know shouldn't be scared of using social media and, and messaging services to to support each other like that. Um it becomes more um, dangerous, I guess, is one way of describing it. If you start sharing clinical information via WhatsApp, Facebook, or any other messaging services that you may have, and, and that does happen. We, we know that doctors, if you go into a ward or a department, you will have a department WhatsApp group maybe, and you will share information on there. And again, that is really useful because actually that might be the best an easiest way for you to contact colleagues, to seek support, to seek advice in, in any situation. But it, it's important that you, if you are sharing that clinical information that you are aware of patient confidentiality and that you don't share any patient identifiable information via those services, because once you post that information onto a WhatsApp group or a Facebook group, wherever it might be, you then lose control of that information and, and that is passed on to everybody in that group. And they could then share that information outside of the group if they wish to. So although you know, we recognize that the usefulness of those messaging services, it is important that you are careful with the information that you are posting. So I'm just going to give you a, a quick scenario here and see what people think about this. So a doctor in training asks a patient if they can take a photograph of the rash on the patient's ankle so they can show it to their consultant who is currently in a meeting. So what, what potential problems might, might this cause and how could any problems that it might cause be addressed? What, what do we think about this type of scenario? Yep, so really good point there. Is it Ahil? I hope I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. That, that the picture may go to a cloud, and that is something that is, you know, you've got to be really aware of. And actually, for a long time, I never considered this. But as soon as you take that picture, you know, if you're using an iPhone, it's likely that straight away that picture is uploaded to the i to the iCloud. And you know you probably forget about it. it. Might sit on your phone. You might end up deleting it at a, at a later date. But even if you delete it off your device, it's likely that it's still going to exist somewhere, you know, in the date in in a database and could be accessed at, at another point. So it's really something to be aware of. And then problems. So, yep, the the data could be shared somewhere else um, could be addressed by taking the patient's consent to sharing the image and blurring out any identification marks so yeah really good point there Aisha so if you are you know there's nothing wrong with taking pictures of things like this particularly as a as a student or a trainee you know you may find it very useful to to take pictures to help your learning and development as you progress through your career if you see things that you've not seen before if you want to use things as evidence within case studies and that type of thing then actually taking a picture could be really useful um as you say you just need to make sure that the patient is consenting to that. So wherever you work in, if you're working in a GP practice or, or a hospital, they should have a process in place for you to be able to consent patients for, for that type of thing. And, and you should familiarize yourself with those processes. Um, Sabina said there may be elements within the picture that can identify the patient, even if they don't include the, the patient's face. So 
yeah, really good point, Sabina. So, you know, sometimes we'll we'll show this case study and we'll discuss it, and you know, lots of students or doctors will think, well, you're just taking a picture of somebody's ankle. What's the chances of being I being able to identify an individual? by a picture of an ankle but you have to be very careful that then that there are no elements within the picture that mean that the patient could be identified it could be that they've you know got marks on their ankle they've got a tattoo they've got you know a bracelet some something around their ankle you know that can be used to identify them further down the line so you know got to be very careful about that and then, yeah, Ahili's come back and, and said that a consultant may ask for a patient's name. So once you start sharing that information, if the consultant then is pressurizing you to share further information so they can identify the patient, you are going to are leaving yourself open to you being the, the person who shares that data and causes that patient, you know, in that kept that patient confidentiality to be breached. So, you know, ways around addressing the issue is exactly as we've discussed, considering taking consent from the patient, um, discussing with the patient, you know, why you want to take the picture. So making sure that the, the patient fully understands, are you, are you taking a picture for your own your own learning? Are you taking a picture because you, you need advice from somebody more senior? Um, and, and talking around those issues, again, lo lots of um, employers now will have their own phones available or, or their own devices available for you to be able to take photographs. So try and avoid using your own device if that's possible, making sure you are aware of um, the policies and procedures within the, the workplace that, that you are that you are. Um, working at it to, to make sure that you don't get into trouble by not following those local policies and procedures but as i say sometimes it is going to be absolutely appropriate that um you know you you look to use things like this for your own learning etc so just one comment there once we get consent it's okay to take the photo as long as it doesn't go onto social media what we need to do if the phone ended up getting lost or stolen so yeah as long as you take the patient's consent and you know the consent form would clearly state what the what the use of the picture was going to be so if you're going to upload it to your e-portfolio you know if what depending on what you are going to do with it the consent form would would set that out for the patient so they were well aware of what was going to to happen with that as I've said, avoiding using your own phone so you don't get into a situation where your phone is stolen or lost and could lead to data breaches that way. But if you've taken the picture in a way that, you know, it cannot be identified, then if somebody steals your phone and you've just got a picture of a patient's ankle with a rash on and there are no identifiable, you know, bits of information on that picture, then it shouldn't lead to any issues further down the line. But you would, you know, you'd want to be following your local processes in terms of reporting that. So, so making sure the trust were aware of, of any issues that could arise. So is verbal consent enough? It, from a GMC perspective, verbal consent is, is absolutely fine. And our guidance around consent says that, that verbal, verbal consent is valid. Um, the issue around consent in these types of situations is that there may well be, and, and I would imagine there would be, sort of local policies and processes in place. So, you know, you would want to make sure you are following those local procedures because, you know, it would be, it may be that um, you, the, the trust has a form that needs to be completed for the patient to sign and you would want to follow those processes. In terms of proving verbal consent, um, you would want to be recording it somewhere. So if you take verbal consent, you should still, you know, for any procedure, whether it's taking a photograph like this or, or something that you are doing on a, you know, a medical procedure on a patient, then you want to be recording that in the medical records because the medical records sit there as, you know, evidence to say why you've carried out whatever whatever procedure or action it, it may, may be on a patient. So as long as you record that somewhere, that would act as, as your proof. And obviously, 
it could become your word against a patient. So I'd always suggest going for the, the written consent if you have concerns around that. So we will have a look at another scenario, slightly different one here, but a patient celebrating their birthday while on their third course of treatment and asked to have a photograph taken with the doctor who has been providing their care for the last 18 months. Is this okay? Would would you be happy to agree to this? And and if you do agree to this, what are the what are the types of things that you need to consider in this scenario? Yep. So first point: take the photo, but hide your ID card. So that's you know sounds maybe maybe you question the why you would need to hide your id card but in, in my experience there are lots of trusts who don't want things posted online that that allow patients or members of the public to identify where a doctor is working so i've been aware previously of, of doctors at a local level who have found themselves in trouble did something online and they've had a lanyard on with with their details or the name of the the hospital that they were working at so yeah, if you are agreeing to take this type of photo make sure that you're not having any of your id um on view anything else that you'd need to consider yep really good point so you don't know the context in which the photo is going to be published so once you've agreed for this photo to be taken you know the the patient can then do whatever they like with the photo they are in control of that so you probably want to have a discussion with the patient wouldn't you and you know maybe ask them to see it one ask ask them if you can have a look at the post one once it's gone online to make sure that you know they are using the the photo in the context that they've they've agreed with you. Yep, ensure no one else is in the photo that isn't happy to to be in there or aware that they are in the photo. So, you know, point from Sarah there comes into being aware of your surroundings. So, you know, knowing that you know there's no other patients in the background who are getting picked up in the photo, there are no other members of staff who aren't aware that they're being included in the photo. And then also making sure there's no information around about the patient who's taking the photo. So you know, there's no medical records or charts that have been left around that, that could accidentally be included in that photo and, and could end up breaching confidentiality. So very much being aware of your surroundings and knowing what is and isn't being included in that photograph. I think generally it's going to be absolutely fine. You're you're going to build up, you know, close relationships with patients in certain scenarios. And I'm sure patients will, you know, will want to take photos for, for memories to, you know, promote the, the amazing treatment that they're receiving. And, you know, as long as you take the right precautions, most of the time that's going to be absolutely fine. It is just about protecting yourself, protecting anybody else who's around and and also protecting the patient who is wanting to take the picture. And we'll look at um, a mistake. Just trying to see. No, I don't think we. So there's a there's a famous picture uh, or a well known picture. I should say famous is probably the right word. Has, an, has anybody seen an example of this? Um, something like this going wrong. It was quite a high profile picture a number of years ago. Anybody, can anybody remember that? If not, um, Jeremy Hunt, during his time as, as the um, health secretary, he visited an, an A&E department in London and he wanted to showcase the fact that he was out there on the front line meeting doctors and nurses in the A&E department. And he asked for a photo got a photograph taken with, you know, standing next to a, a few doctors and nurses. But what he'd not realized was that in the background of the picture was a whiteboard with all the names and details of the patients and 
that, that were on the ward at that time. And Jeremy Hunt then took got the picture, ended up uh, posting it onto Twitter and came in for, for an awful lot of criticism because of that. So you can, if you search that, I'm sure you'd be able to find find the picture. The whiteboard is now uh, blanked out, but you'd be able to see how, how easily those types of mistakes can be made. So we'll move on and, and think more about patient's use of social media and and how that's becoming more and more relevant for doctors, I think. So how many of you have Googled yourselves previously or, or Google yourselves on a regular basis? Anybody do that? So Sarah, yes. Yep. Nobody else wants to admit to, yep. So it, sound, it sounds very strange, I think, and I talk to you know lots of doctors about this and get some uh, some funny looks at times and some you know questions about why why you would do that. But actually, you know, if you take nothing away from this afternoon's session, if you don't Google yourself, I would suggest doing so. Uh, you know, a couple of times a year maybe because it's a really good way of just seeing what information is out there about you, which is available. To potentially available to, to patients that you may be treating. So, you know, if I Google myself, there's there's many more famous and well-known Chris Lawlers in the world. So I find nothing about myself. But actually, you know, if you've got a you know a name that's not so common, then you know, if you Google yourself, you will find links to Facebook, Instagram, you know, articles where your name might have been included. So it's really a really useful exercise, first and foremost, for checking your privacy settings on any social media that you might have. So if Facebook or Instagram all of a sudden change the privacy settings, which means you know, anybody can access your Facebook profile, then you know, being aware of that can help you and, and help you sort of sort out those privacy settings. But also for, for you to know what patients may be aware of about you already. So um, it, was, it was about 12 months ago now, I ran, I ran a social media session with a group of F2s, asked them about Google. None of them you know, had, had done that regularly. And what I, one of them said, what's the point? So I, I sort of challenged her and she typed her name into Google and it came up with a whole load of articles and information about her that she had no idea was available on the internet and that patients could freely access it it was you know there's nothing nothing so bad it was just information about her so she she'd been a quite a you know quite a good runner in 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 her youth and she held some records at her local running club etc and there was just lots of information about her past and her history and it's just useful to know that if a patient was to Google your name, that's the sort of information that they're going to find out about you. So, you know, having that awareness, I think, can be really useful. So have any of you on Facebook, have any of you... Yep, no, no problem at all for anybody joining. This is, you know, this works, I think, for, you know, those who are aspiring to to look at medical school and, and, a, and a career in medicine moving forward for med students or for current you know doctors i think it's really important to to have that awareness of social media because i think you know everything is on social media nowadays that you know in in the current climate it's it's something that we are all probably using on a regular basis. So to have that awareness of how it could impact on your career in the future is really important. So any of you that are on Facebook, have any of you had um, friend requests from any patients that you that you may be treating or patients that you've treated previously? So if you have just, you know, I think, no, that's, that's, 
it's positive that you that you're not receiving those requests but again it, it's something that's becoming more and more common and and there are now more sort of complaints being doctors are raising complaints that patients are approaching them through social media sending messages through facebook or instagram and really trying to track down information about doctors with which is just not appropriate really and, and isn't helpful for that doctor patient relationship so if you do receive friend requests then you know i'm sure you would treat them in a professional manner and you know just disregard them really if it's something that you feel uncomfortable with then it's you know you maybe need to discuss that with with your workplace and take some advice from them um if if it's something that continues, then it may be that you need to discuss it with the patient, but lots of support available if you ever did feel that patients were were trying to approach things in an unprofessional manner that, that was compromising the relationship that you have with them. Um, were you aware of the sort of patient comments and reviews? So again, it's sort of not the social media as we as we often think of it, but again, you know, more and more common is patients being able to leave reviews online about, you know, the the treatment that they've received and, and the experiences that they've had. So there's a website called NHS Choices, um, a bit like, um, a, you know, leave, leaving reviews that, that you do after holidays that patients can now go on and you know rate the experience that they've received and a way of providing feedback to to the to the trust that that they're visiting but can be useful on one hand for for the trust to receive that feedback but it can also be quite difficult because if you were to go on and look at this and you know you could potentially see negative feedback that that you could take personally um and and it, it could really affect you so you know be very careful if if you are using these types of websites and, and looking at reviews etc uh, just having a look at that comment so advice about social media profiles such as twitter Yeah, so in terms of using any sort of profile, so if you want to be on Twitter, again, if you have a look at the social media guidance, it, it talks about you know identifying yourself as a doctor. So if you're if you're on Twitter, absolutely no problem with with any doctor being on Twitter, and and it's totally up to you whether you want to have a private or a public account. If it is public and that you are talking about, you know your role as a doctor so if you are sharing your experiences in your views you know in your role as a doctor it's important that you 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 have your name in the profile or, or you identify who you are because you know if people are reading that if members of the public are seeing your views and opinions you know perhaps on different types of treatment etc they, they need to be able to make sure that you are who you say you are and, and they can come to the GMC and search your name and make sure that you are actually a doctor so so they you know they can take your views and opinions on board that way. Um, I think it is a, a really good way of interacting with you know fellow colleagues and and like-minded individuals. I would totally agree with that. So I think having a public account can can certainly have a, a very positive effect but you then do also leave yourself open to you know the negatives of of patients being able to to follow you and being able to maybe tweet you to ask for advice or tweet you if they've not had a good experience so you just have to be be very careful about that now, as long as again as it as, as long as it's managed in a professional manner then you know you shouldn't shouldn't hopefully have any issues if you did if you did get into a situation where a patient was you know approaching things in a, in an unprofessional way sending you you know, you know maybe abusive tweets or messages then i would suggest to you know you discuss that with your employers and, and they should be able to give you advice around that and how to best protect yourself um so 
what about LinkedIn? Do, so do we mean in terms of considering LinkedIn as social media or any specific issues around LinkedIn? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it would be considered social media, but again, it, it's thinking about the information that is being shared in there, you know, if you are if you're a doctor and you are using LinkedIn, then you've just got to make sure that the information on there is all accurate and and up to date, and you shouldn't be embellishing on on any of your experiences or, or qualifications using LinkedIn because that could then lead to you know issues issues in the future. But again, it it's really a lot of it is common sense, and it's about using your own common sense and about using social media and in a professional manner, really, whether that be using Twitter, whether that be sending emails, using LinkedIn, those types of things, as long as you are using them in in a professional manner and you're not sort of abusing and, and sending you know, derogatory comments, then, then you shouldn't get yourselves into any trouble in the future. So quick example here. This actually goes back to the point raised earlier about pictures being stored on the iCloud. So this is actually a real life example from a trainee GP who posted um, some photos online of a patient. And actually, this trainee had taken the photos a number of years ago, had totally forgotten about them. And then a few years, you know, time went by and the, the trainee found these photos on, on their iCloud and then decided to post them online um, with some pretty derogatory comments on there. And this case was referred to the, the General Medical Council, was investigated and referred to a, a medical practitioner's tribunal service where the doctor's fitness to practice was found to be impaired. And this doctor, actually had conditions imposed on their registration. So they weren't removed from the register. They weren't suspended at all. What this doctor had to do was inform any of their future employees, employers, sorry, about this case. So they had to make employers aware that they had, they'd been investigated by the GMC, that they, their fitness to practice had been impaired and they'd have to explain why that was so can have quite a long lasting impact on on a doctor's career just by making quite a quite a stupid mistake really something that that's probably you know the doctor i'm sure now regrets and, and probably at the time didn't think much of it but it can have that long last long lasting implications another example from the media this this is a an a and e doctor who was um on twitter and was sharing um, some of their thoughts on patients that they'd been seeing and it it started off probably what what seems like quite harmless tweets really something that uh, maybe a number of doctors would agree with but it went on over a number of months these tweets and, and started getting worse and worse you know to the point where you know just unacceptable things being tweeted by by this doctor and this actually led to uh, an internal investigation at, at the trust where the doctor works and an action being taken. But the, the big thing that I always think about when I when I look at this case study is that this doctor was on Twitter and was sharing this sort of information and you know was posting things that you know started off you know verging on unprofessional and, and then got to being very unprofessional. But at no point did the, the doctor's colleagues approach the doctor and, and ask if everything was okay because if this is very much out of character if you're not usually posting things on a regular basis but then all of a sudden yourself or one of your colleagues starts posting information like this then actually maybe this could have been avoided if one of the doctor's colleagues had just approached them and, and asked if everything was okay you know do they need some support are things getting on top of them you know, are they struggling maybe with you know some uh, a mental health condition? Are they are they stressed about the role? So, 
think things like this can be avoided by looking out for for your colleagues and looking out for each other on a daily basis. And we'll skip through this. So is there anything wrong with this picture, do we think? What, what could be wrong with this picture? Yep, so the ID card's on show. I'll come back to Sarah's comment in a minute. May give the impressions of doctors a drink in at work. Patients might see it. Yep, suggest they are consuming alcohol at work, practicing under the influence. So th this is a really tricky picture because th there's so many different ways that this picture can be, that, that you can view this picture. It could be a fancy dress party. These these three individuals may, may not even be doctors. They may just be going to a fancy dress party and it could just be, you know, totally innocent it could be that these doctors live together or they've gone to a party straight from work and it just so happens that they've not had a chance to get changed and, and they're just having a quick drink could be that these drinks are non-alcoholic we, we don't know whether whether there's alcohol involved here but exactly as as you've all said really on first viewing it looks as though you know it's quite unprofessional it looks like we've got three doctors who are still at work and seem to be enjoying an alcoholic drink. So starts to raise the questions that, that you are all raising there. So just really show this as an example of something that could be totally innocent. And I don't know the background to this picture, but once you put that on social media, you are leaving that open to interpretation from anybody who has access to, to that photo. So, you know, even if it's f just friends and family on Facebook, you know they may see see a picture like this and and they may jump to conclusions. So, just be very aware when you are posting things that, you know, people who don't don't know the context of the picture will make will draw their own conclusions and make their own decisions. I'm just going to go back up to Sarah's comments. So would you report would you report to someone else about tweets from a colleague or talk to the individual themselves? Um, very much depends. To be, being totally honest, I think it you know ideal situation. The ideal scenario is that you would feel comfortable and you would have the sort of relationship with the colleague where you could approach them yourselves and you could offer to support them. You could talk to them, you know, openly and honestly, but. You know, I think we all know that that's, you know, we don't live in an, in an ideal world and that's not always going to be, you know, the most appropriate way to approach a situation. If it's somebody more senior, if it's somebody who you've not got a great working relationship with, maybe, then it's very difficult to, to say, I will go and approach and speak to that individual. So it may be that you need to take advice and, and you need to seek support from colleagues or you know hr department uh, freedom to speak up guardians you know, the different areas that you could go and adv get advice and and decide what to do in that situation i think if you do feel comfortable then go and speak to them directly and offer that support but that's not always going to be be possible i don't think i agree coming up to the last five minutes yep well i'll be wrapping up in a second so message i, I would say you know, this is clearly about tweeting, but I would say before posting anything on social media, before you send that WhatsApp message about with patient information, before you put something on Facebook, you know, just think before you, you press send and, and make sure that, you know, that whatever it, that picture that you're posting, that information that you're sending to a colleague doesn't contain in any information that could you know, potentially breach uh, data protection and patient confidentiality or, or could be viewed out of context and could cause you issues moving forward. Um, the guidance, so, you know, we've done a quick run through in 40 minutes, but 
The guidance is online. You can go and have a read of it in more detail. Guess the takeaway messages. The standards expected of a doctor do not change just because you may be communicating through social media rather than face to face. So, you know, put things on social media that you would be happy discussing with colleagues and patients in, in a face to face conversation. Um, always be aware that social media sites cannot guarantee confidentiality, whatever the privacy settings may be. So, make sure you do as much as you can to protect yourself. And if you identify as a doctor in in public in publicly accessible social media, you should identify yourself by name as as we talked about earlier. So three key takeaway messages, but please do go and have a look at the guidance and have a read of that in more detail. We won't do this last bit because it would take too long. We were going to do a bit of a ranking exercise, but hopefully you'll get to see that in the in the future in GMC sessions. And I will wrap it up there. I think there might be a couple of minutes over already, but thank you for coming along. Thank you for joining the session. Really appreciate you getting involved in the chat and, and joining in. That, that makes it much more helpful and, and enjoyable from my point of view. So I'll wrap things up there. Got my contact details here. Feel free to drop me an email. Also got the GMC booth where I'll be around for the next 15, 20 minutes. If you want to ask me any, any specific questions, feel free to do so. If not, then best of luck in your future careers and, and hopefully I will see some of you around in the future.